Selected salient systems and focal topics reviewed in this chapter are the integument system, muscular system, skeletal system, cardiovascular system, lymphatic system, respiratory system, digestive system, central nervous system, endocrine system, urinary system, reproductive system, body fluids and electrolytes, and cell structure, organization, and physiology. 1.1 The integument system The integument system consists of the skin and associated specializations such as nails, hair, and sebaceous and sweat glands. Skin is the largest non-visceral organ of the body and consists of the outer epithelial layer, called the AP dermis, and an inner connective tissue, known as the dermis. Skin serves to cool and rid the body of toxic waste through the secretion, excretion, and evaporation of sweat from sweat glands. It also protects the body from desiccation and mechanical abrasion. The epidermis is a nonvascular layer and is made up of stratified squamous epithelium, which grows from the deeper basal layer to the outermost keratinized squamous cells of the corneum. Epidermis lay ERS from deep to superficial, are the stratum basale stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum elucidum, and stratum corneum. The dermis consists of dense, irregular connective tissue that is highly vascular and rich in lymphatics and cutaneous nerves. The hypodermis is a looser connective tissue layer that facilitates movement of the overlying skin. For clinical purposes, the skin is highly absorptive and facilitates the uptake of topically applied medications, such as salves and ointments. Also, subcutaneous medications may be administered to vascular rich deep connective tissue through hypodermic injections. 1.2 Muscular System The function of the muscular system is to dynamically overcome gravity and to facilitate locomotion through movement of the skeleton and various organs of the body. Types of muscle cells Skeletal muscle cells are voluntary and highly involved in movement of the skeleton and the musculoskeletal system. Skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated rectangular or cigar-shaped structures and are contained by a cell membrane called the plasmalemma or sarcolemma. Cardiac muscle cells are striated and involuntary and are found in the heart. They are responsible for contraction of the heart. Smooth muscle cells are uninucleated and involuntary. Smooth muscle is located in the walls of hollow organs, such as the stomach intestines, bladder, blood vessels, and uterus. Organelles of the skeletal muscle cell The cytoplasm of the muscle cell is filled with synchronously arranged and linearly organized protein strands called myofilaments. Mitochondria, Golgi vesicles, lysosomes, and other organelles are randomly situated between myofibrils. Myofilaments Each myofibril contains cross-striated regions of alternating light and dark bands. The dark bands are called A-bands. A-bands consist of overlapping thin actin filaments and thick myosins. The light bands, or striations, are called I-bands. I-bands contain only thin actin filaments. Z-lines are places where adjacent thin filaments connect or abut to one another. Myofibrils can be subdivided into smaller linear units called microfilaments. The sliding filament theory of muscle contraction suggests that thick and thin myofilaments interdigitate and slide between and with one another during muscle contraction. Calcium and, ad calcium and adenosine triphosphate ADP, are vital in producing muscle contraction. Endomysium and paramysium A single skeletal muscle cell is enclosed or surrounded in a delicate layer of connective tissue layer called the endomysium. The endomysium of several closely situated or adjacent muscle fibers blend together to form coarser connective tissue called paramysium. This tissue sequesters or organizes muscle fibers into numerous muscle bundles. The paramysium is rich in blood vessels, which provide nourishment for the muscle. Epimysium The overall muscle organ is covered by a layer of coarse connective tissue, which is called the epimysium. The epimysium coalesces at each end of the muscle at its bony tendinous attachment. 
origins, insertions, and action muscles attach to bones through tendons. The tendinous muscle attachment that moves the least during muscle contraction is called the origin, the attachment that moves the most is the insertion. The work that the muscle performs during its contraction is called the action. Classifications and types Skeletal muscles are classified according to size, mag number, shape, rhomboid, function, levator, and number of tendinous attachments, digastricus. Types of skeletal muscle actions include flexion, extension, rotation, abduction, adduction, elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, dilation, and constriction. Neuromuscular junction skeletal muscle fibers require neuronal input to contract or act. Efferent axons terminate on skeletal muscle cells at specialized synaptic sites of contact called motor end plates or the neuromuscular junction. The motor end plate synapse is where the axon terminal releases a neurotransmitter, usually acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft. Specialized receptors are located on the plasma membrane of the muscle cell that can be energized by the neurotransmitter to produce an axon potential in the muscle cell. Nerve impulses, also known as action potentials, travel from the brain or spinal cord to trigger the contraction of skeletal muscles. An action potential propagates down a motor neuron to a skeletal muscle fiber. The site where a motor neuron excites a skeletal muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. This junction is a chemical synapse consisting of the points of contact between the axon terminals of a motor neuron and the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle fiber. The events at the neuromuscular junction occur in seven coordinated steps. Step 1. An action potential travels the length of the axon of a motor neuron to an axon terminal. Step 2. Voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium ions diffuse into the terminal. Step 3. Calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine via exocytosis. Step 4. Acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to acetylcholine receptors which contain ligand-gated cation channels. Step 5. These ligand-gated cation channels open. Step 6. Sodium ions, shown here in red, enter the fiber, and potassium ions, shown here in blue, exit the muscle fiber. The greater inward flux of sodium ions relative to the outward flux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become less negative. Step 7. Once the membrane potential reaches a threshold value, an action potential propagates along the sarcolemma. Neural transmission to a muscle fiber ceases when acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft. This removal occurs in two ways. 1. Acetylcholine diffuses away from the synapse. 2. Acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase to acetic acid and choline. Choline is then transported into the axon terminal for the resynthesis of acetylcholine. One point three skeletal system The bony skeleton of the human is internally located and provides protection from mechanical injury and attachment for muscles. It stores and, when necessary, 
releases calcium and other vital inorganic salts, is instrumental in blood formation through bone marrow, and acts as scaffolding in overcoming gravity. Bone cells types include the following, osteocytes. These mature melon-shaped bone cells are trapped in lacunae and maintain bone matrix. Osteoclasts. These multinucleated bone cells enzymatically digest and remodel bone matrix. Osteoblasts. These young bone cells actively build bone matrix. Mature bone matrix consists of layers of helically organized connective tissue fibers, collagen, elastin, and reticulin, that surround blood vessels in Haversian systems. The bone matrix is also infiltrated by calcium and phosphate crystalline salts, which are responsible for its rigidity and represent 65% of a bone's weight. Haversian systems The crystallized and calcified lamellae of the Haversian system contain small, shallow depressions called lacunae. These lacunae contain osteocytes. Each lacuna is connected to several fracture line-like linear spaces in adjacent matrix called canaliculi. This is the structure of bone. Spongy or cancellous bone form the center bulk of all our bones. Its honeycomb structure keeps bones light, in contrast to the heavier, compact bone, which gives it strength. Bone cells, or osteocytes, are contained in spaces called lacunae. The minute projections of bone cells trail into adjoining channels known as caniculi. Tissue fluid, which fills the lacunae, allows the transfer of materials between bone cells and capillaries. Haversian systems, each about one-sixtieth of an inch wide, make up the structure of compact bone. Each system is formed by a series of rings called lamellae, which are deposits of mineral salts and collagen fibers. Haversian canals, which run through the center of each Haversian system, contain the blood and lymphatic vessels supplying the bone. Here, arteries carrying oxygenated blood are shown in red. Veins carrying deoxygenated blood are shown in blue. The lymphatic vessels are shown in white. A section through the shaft of the femur, a long bone, shows a central mass of spongy bone surrounded by the branching tubular Haversian systems. Blood vessels on the bone surface reach into the center of each Haversian system supplying the bone cells. Classification of bone Bones can be classified as short, long, irregular, and flat. They are attached to one another by joints. Joints are movable or NONMovable. Selected MOVable joints include ball and socket, hinge, sliding, and peg and socket. Muscles attached to bone by tendons. Red bone marrow contains sinusoidal line blood vessels and primitive blood forming cells that divide and differentiate into mature blood corpuscles. Organization of the skeleton The skeleton proper can be subdivided into two units, the axial and appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton consists of the skull and vertebral column. The appendicular skeleton contains the upper and lower extremities and the pectoral and pelvic girdles. Selected bones of the cranium include the frontal maxilla, mandible, sphenoid, parietal, temporal, occipital, nasal, and zygoma. Selected vertebrae and their number on the vertebral column are as follows, cervical, 7, thoracic, 12, lumbar, 5, sacral, 5, and coccygeal, 3. Vertebra components include the body, pedicles lamina, transverse process, and posterior spine. The neural canal contains the spinal cord and is located between the lamina and pedicles. Spaces between adjacent vertebrae are occupied by a fibrocartilaginous body called the intervertebral disc. The disc can be subdivided into an outer region of biaxially arranged layers of fibrocartilage called the annulus fibrosus and an inner soft, pulpy center referred to as the nucleus pulposus. 
the nucleus pulposus may be herniated and project through the annulus fibrosus posterior laterally and compress the spinal nerve, resulting in sciatica and lower back pain. Vertebrae specializations and classification The cervical vertebrae are the smallest vertebrae. They facilitate spinal movement, rotation, hexion, and extension. The atlas. The atlas, which is the first cervical vertebra, contains no centrum or body and articulates with the condyles of the occipital bone of the skull. This arrangement provides extension and flexion of the skull on the atlas. The axis which is the second cervical vertebra, contains a cranially oriented projection from its centrum or body called the dens. The dens articulates with the anterior arch of the atlas, thus facilitating rotary movement. Regional differences exist in the morphology of cervical through coccygeal vertebrae. Each of the twelve thoracic vertebrae is attached whole or partially to a rib and provides protection to thoracic viscera and points of attachment for thoracic musculature. The five independent lumbar vertebrae are larger and are the strongest components of the vertebral column. The five sacral vertebrae are fused into a single, solid triangular mass of bone, which articulates with the iliac bones of the pelvic girdle as the sacroiliac joint. Coccygeal vertebrae are 3 to 4 in number and are small and vestigial. Curvatures of the vertebrae and spine include the cervical curvature, the thoracic curvature, the lumbar curvature, and the sacral curvature. Ribs 12 pairs of ribs can be included with the axial skeleton, and they articulate with thoracic vertebrae posteriorly and the sternum anteriorly. The ribs and clavicle attach to the sternum anteriorly and the sternum acts to limit the thorax ventrally. Rib types are as follows, true, 1 to 7, false, 8 to 10, floating, 11 to 12, sternum The sternum is located anteriorly in the thorax and consists of the manubrium, body, and xiphoid process. The appendicular skeleton The appendicular skeleton consists of the pectoral girdle and upper extremity and the pelvic girdles and lower extremity. Bones of pectoral girdle are the clavicle and the scapula. Major bones of the upper limb include the humerus of the arm, the radius, and ulna of the forearm, the carpal bones of the wrist, the metacarpal bones of the hand, and the phalanges of the digits. Bones of the pelvic girdle include the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. Bones of the lower limb proper include the femur of the thigh, the tibia, and fibula of the leg the tarsal bones of the ankle, the metatarsal bones of the foot, and the phalanges of the digits. 1.4 The cardiovascular system The cardiovascular system is an enclosed entity and includes the heart, arteries, veins, and capillaries. The tissue organization of blood vessels The intima is the innermost epithelial layer of blood vessels. The flat Plate-like squamous cells of the intima facilitate the flow of blood and prevent clotting. Mechanical damage or the accumulation of calcium and fatty deposits in the intima may cause blood clots, which may cause cerebral accidents, strokes, and coronary artery heart disease. The media is the middle layer of blood vessels and is the thickest layer in arteries. The adventitia is wider or thicker in veins. The smooth muscle cell media of arteries tends to be arranged in several circular layers, one in arterioles and up to 25 in some large muscular arteries. The media may contain several laminae of elastic fibers. The adventitia is an outer layer of predominantly connective tissue. The adventitia of veins may contain one or more longitudinally arranged smooth muscle layers and may contain scant or rich laminae of elastic fibers. Types of arteries include large arteries, medium arteries, small arteries, and arterioles. Veins, which accompany arteries, usually have larger diameters and thinner walls. Types of veins include large veins, medium veins, small veins, and venules. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels and consist of an endothelial layer surrounded by connective tissue. 
Oxygen and carbon dioxide readily diffuse from the blood cells and plasma across the thin, simple squamous endothelial layer of the intima into the connective tissue and the surrounding tissue fluid. The heart The heart is a modified blood vessel that functions to pump blood to various parts of the body. The heart contains three tissue layers in cross-section, epicardium. An outer layer of mesothelium and connective tissue. Myocardium. A middle layer of several laminae of cardiac muscle. Endocardium. An inner layer of simple squamous epithelium. The human heart has four chambers. The two upper chambers are the atria, and the two lower chambers are the ventricles. The interatrial septum separates the two atria, and the interventricular septum is the partition between the two ventricles. The right atrium and right ventricle are connected through a tricuspid valve. As the name suggests, it has three leaflets or cusps. On the other side, the left atrium and ventricle are connected through a bicuspid valve. The bicuspid valve is also called the mitral valve because of its resemblance to a bishop's two-sided mitre, or hat. The leaflets of these atrioventricular valves are connected to fibrous tissue called the chordae tendinae, which in turn are attached to papillary muscles. Contraction and relaxation of these muscles make the valves open and close. There are also valves at the opening of the pulmonary trunk and the iota. These are called the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve, respectively. Because of their crescent moon shape, these two valves are also called semilunar valves. The characteristic double-up sound of the heartbeat is produced during the closing of the heart valves. The thickness of the walls of the four heart chambers varies with their functions. The walls of the atria are thinner than those of the ventricles, as the blood needs to be pumped into adjacent ventricles only. The left ventricle pumps blood a greater distance at higher pressure. Therefore, the wall of the left ventricle is thicker than that of the right ventricle. The sinoatrial node atrioventricular node, bundle of HIS and Purkinje fibers represent the specialized cardiac tissue. These fibers are auto-excitable as they have the potential to generate electrical activity without any external stimuli. This makes the heart beat continuously. The cardiovascular system is one of the first systems to form in an embryo and the heart is the first functional organ. Thanks to this amazing organ and its pumping action, blood is able to circulate around the body. In the following presentation, we will look at blood flow through a healthy heart and a heart with a congenital heart disorder called an atrial septal defect. The heart's job is to pump blood through the body. The right and left sides of the heart work together in unison to pump blood continuously. In the right side of the heart, deoxygenated blood flows in through the superior and the inferior vena cava, both of which are major veins that collect oxygen-poor blood from the systemic circulation of the upper and lower parts of the body. It then enters the right atrium under low pressure during diastole and drains into the right ventricle through the open, right atrioventricular valve, commonly called the tricuspid valve. As with all of the valves within the heart, it is a one-way valve that prevents the backflow of blood. When the right ventricle is full, the tricuspid valve closes and the ventricle contracts. This contraction pumps blood out of the ventricle under pressure during systole through the pulmonary semilunar valve and into the pulmonary artery. It is then taken to the lungs where the blood picks up oxygen 
and drops off carbon dioxide before returning to the heart. This is known as pulmonary circulation. Once the blood is freshly oxygenated in the lungs, it returns to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins and drains into the left ventricle through the left atrioventricular valve, commonly known as the bicuspid or mitral valve. The left ventricle contracts, pumping blood through the aortic semilunar valve under high pressure into the arch of the aorta that descends and delivers oxygenated blood via arteries, arterioles and capillaries to all the cells of the body. As it moves through the capillaries, it loses oxygen and picks up carbon dioxide and the now deoxygenated blood travels through venules, into veins and into the superior and inferior vena cava to start the cycle all over again. As we can see, this amazingly complex organ not only circulates the blood and keeps our immune system healthy and our heart pumping, it literally maintains and sustains our life. Electrical activity of the heart and electrocardiograph tracing has three components or waves. AP wave, which occurs with atria depolarization, contraction, a QRS wave complex, which represents depolarization of the ventricles, contraction, an AT wave, which represents electrical activity, repolarization, or relaxation of the ventricles. Your heart is a muscle that works continuously, much like a pump. Each beat of your heart is set in motion by an electrical signal from within your heart muscle. The electrical activity is recorded by an electrocardiogram, known as an EKG or ECG. Each beat of your heart begins with an electrical signal from the sinoatrial node, also known as the SA node. The SA node is located in your heart's right atrium. When your heart's right atrium is full with blood, the electrical signal spreads across the cells of your heart's right and left atria. This signal causes the atria to contract or squeeze. This pumps blood through the open valves from the atria into both ventricles. The P wave on the EKG marks the contraction of your heart's atria. The signal arrives at the atrioventricular or AV node near the ventricles. Here it is slowed for an instant to allow your heart's right and left ventricles to fill with blood. On an EKG, this interval is represented by the start of the line segment between the P and Q wave. The signal is released and moves next to the bundle of His located in your heart's ventricles. From the bundle of His, the signal fibers divide into left and right bundle branches which run through your heart's septum. On the EKG, this is represented by the Q wave. The signal leaves the left and right bundle branches through the Purkinje fibers that connect directly to the cells in the walls of your heart's ventricles. The signal spreads quickly across your heart's ventricles. As the signal spreads across the cells of the ventricle walls, both ventricles contract, but not at exactly the same moment. The left ventricle of your heart contracts an instant before the right ventricle. On an EKG, the R wave marks the contraction of your heart's left ventricle. The S wave marks the contraction of your heart's right ventricle. The contraction of your heart's right ventricle pushes blood through the pulmonary valve to your lungs. The contraction of your heart's left ventricle pushes blood through the aortic valve to the rest of your body. As the signal passes, the walls of your heart's ventricles relax and await the next signal. On the EKG, the T wave marks the point at which your heart's ventricles are relaxing. This process continues over and over.
1.5 The lymphatic system The lymph nodes and the spleen, thymus gland, and tonsils produce lymphocytes, which contain macrophage-like, phagocytic lymphatic cells. These cells engulf and destroy invasive microbial cells. The thymus gland is the source of thymic lymphocytes, T-lymphocytes, which, after maturity, are distributed to other lymphatic organs. The spleen is the largest lymph organ of the body and also functions to store and destroy old red blood corpuscles. The lymphatic system. Lymph vessels are found in all tissues except the central nervous system, the bone marrow, and tissues without blood vessels such as cartilage. The lymph system vessels are extensive as the vessels of the circulatory system. The lymphatic system serves several functions. It controls fluid balance by draining and cleansing the fluids that leave the circulatory system to deliver nutrients and gases to the tissues. It interacts with the villi in the digestive system to absorb and deliver fats to the circulatory system. It also has an immunological protection from viruses, bacteria, fungi, and cellular debris that could damage the cells of the body. From your understanding of the circulatory system, you know that the blood passes through the arteries, arterioles, and then the capillaries. The capillary walls allow the fluid portion of the blood to exit the capillaries into the surrounding tissues. Once the fluid leaves the capillaries, it is called interstitial fluid. About 90% of this fluid will diffuse back into the capillaries because of the difference in concentrations of the fluid. However, about 10% of the fluid will enter the open-ended lymph vessels. Once the fluid has entered the lymph vessels, it's now called lymph. These vessels eventually deliver the lymph to locations where the lymph can be cleansed of debris and check for the presence of pathogenic organisms. How it gets the lymph there is pretty amazing. There is no heart for this system of vessels to pump the lymph around. So how does a lymph get to the locations it needs to be delivered to? The lymph moves through your body when you move your skeletal muscles. The contraction of skeletal muscles squeezes the nearby lymph vessels, pumping them. This pushes lymph through the vessels. In addition to the contraction of skeletal muscles, there are two other means by which lymph travels through the lymphatic system. There are smooth muscles at the larger lymph vessels. The contraction of these smooth muscles adds to the force provided by the skeletal muscles. Also, when we breathe, pressure changes occur in the thoracic region. When the thoracic pressure drops, that tends to pull lymph into the thoracic duct. One-way valves prevent the lymph from flowing backwards. The function of fluid balance is seen best, perhaps, when it goes awry. When the lymphatic system is prevented from doing its job, the fluids build up in the tissues. Edemas is the term given to this medical condition. Mild edema can occur during pregnancy when the weight of the baby slows the ability of the vessels to move the lymph up the body. More serious levels of edema can occur in a tropical disease called elephantitis in which a parasite blocks the vessels and the edema that is produced looks a lot like having legs of an elephant. Some lymph tissue is very diffuse with no clear boundaries. You can actually feel some when you rub your lower inner lip with your tongue. Others are more organized into groups, and these are called lymph nodes. Lymph nodes have three functions. First, they are testing stations. They monitor the blood by receiving samples of the blood plasma. Second, if the sample is rife with foreign invaders, they produce lymphocytes and send them into the bloodstream to try to destroy those invaders. In addition, the lymph nodes filter the lymph that they have so they can only return clean fluid back to the blood. Eventually, the lymph is returned to the circulatory system via the right and the left subclavian veins in the shoulders just above the heart level. Lymph nodules can be found as single structures in the body, or they can be grouped together in small clumps. That's what the tonsils are. They're groups of lymph nodules under the mucous membrane in the throat. These lymph nodules form a protective ring around the throat strategically located to protect the body from foreign invaders. If the tonsils get infected, they can become inflamed and abnormally enlarged, as you see here. This condition is called tonsillitis. If the condition is chronic, the tonsils can be removed in a tonsillectomy. Tonsils tend to get smaller as a person matures, and they can actually disappear altogether in an adult. Peyer's patches are very similar to tonsils. 
there are groups of lymphocytes in lymph nodules that are in the small intestines. Typically, they're found in the last third of the small intestine. Once again, they're strategically located to deal with foreign invaders. The lymphatic system's second function takes place here in the small intestine as well, the absorption of fats. We will discuss this more in depth in the topic of digestion, but for now know that there are specialized lymph vessels called lacteals in the intestinal villi. These pick up fats that are released from digested food and absorb it into the villus tissue. The liquid in the vessels take on a milky color. Instead of being called lymph, this fluid is called chyle. The chyle eventually gets dumped in the subclavian vein, just like lymph. That is how the fats enter the circulatory system. The spleen is a significant lymphatic structure, and it has a lot in common with the smaller nodes throughout the body. But unlike the lymph nodes, the spleen does not filter lymph. It's part of the lymphatic system, however, because it filters the blood. As the blood passes through the white pulp of the spleen, foreign invaders stimulate a response from the diffuse lymphatic tissue or the lymph nodules. The spleen also works to clean the blood of worn-out erythrocytes. Remember, red blood cells have a short lifespan. As a result, roughly two million erythrocytes die every second. They must be removed from the blood, and that's another job of the spleen. Before the blood leaves the spleen through the veins, it passes through the red pulp. Macrophages and the red pulp engage in phagocytosis to remove both foreign invaders and worn-out red blood cells. The third function of the spleen is to act as a reservoir for oxygen-rich blood. The spleen actually holds more blood than is necessary for its own metabolism. Therefore, it's an extra blood supply full of oxygen and nutrients. This serves as a backup supply of blood in case of blood loss. If the body detects blood loss due to hemorrhage, the sympathetic division of the ANS stimulates the smooth muscles in the capsule of the spleen to contract. This pushes the backup supply of blood into the bloodstream, compensating for the blood loss. Although the backup supply of blood in the human spleen is rather minor, it's a major factor in the physiology of some other mammals. Seals use the spleen as a built-in oxygen tank. When the seal dives, it conserves its oxygen as much as possible. However, when it's running low and cannot get to the surface, the smooth muscles of the spleen contract, sending the oxygen-rich blood stored there into the bloodstream. This gives the seal more time before it must surface to breathe. Although the spleen is part of the lymphatic system, you can live without it. If your spleen is ruptured due to an injury, it can be removed in a splenectomy. This is often necessary in order to stop internal bleeding because the spleen is so vascular. Once your spleen is removed, tissues in the liver as well as other lymphatic tissues in the body take over the first two tasks of the spleen. Of course, the overall function is not as good as when the spleen was present in the body. As a result, people who have their spleens removed are more susceptible to infections and more sensitive to hemorrhage. The spleen is roughly the size of a clenched fist. Unlike lymph nodes, however, the capsule, or outer cover of the spleen, contains smooth muscle tissue. Extensions of this capsule, called trabeculae, make up the skeleton of the node. The lymph nodes are fed by several afferent lymph vessels. However, lymph exits through just one efferent lymph vessel. Reticular fibers extend from the trabeculae, forming a net of connective tissue throughout the lymph node. Inside the spleen, there are two types of tissue, red pulp, and white pulp. The white pulp is composed of diffuse lymphatic tissue and lymph nodules, much like the lymph node. This white pulp surrounds the arteries which enter the spleen. The red pulp is made of twisted veins and reticular fibers which are full of blood cells which were in the capillaries of the spleen. Lymph nodules contain germinal centers where rapid mitosis of lymphocytes can take place in response to foreign invaders found in the lymph. Lymphocytes produced in the germinal centers are released into the lymph and eventually reach the bloodstream, where they can be transported to the tissues. Another lymphatic system structure is the thymus gland. Like the tonsils, the thymus gland changes as a person matures. When a person is young, the thymus gland is large in proportion to the body size. During this stage of life, it is mostly lymphatic tissue. After puberty, it decreases in size and becomes mostly fibrous and fatty tissue. What does the thymus gland do? Like many things in the human body, the scientific community is still rather puzzled by the thymus gland. We know that while a person is young, immature lymphocytes known as T lymphocytes leave the bone marrow, remember, blood cells are made in the bone marrow, and they travel to the thymus. 
The remarkable maturation process, sometimes referred to as thymic education, T lymphocytes that are beneficial to the immune system are spared, while T lymphocytes that might evoke a detrimental immunological response are eliminated. For example, if you have type A blood, T lymphocytes which attack the A antigen are destroyed. However, T lymphocytes which attack the B antigen are allowed to mature and enter the bloodstream. Notice that this one is called a gland. That means that one of its functions is to secrete hormones, making it also a part of the endocrine system as well as the lymphatic system. It produces hormones. Principal among them is the hormone thymosin. What does thymosin in the body do? Well, we're not really sure. We know that it affects the immunological response of the body. However, the way that it's done remains unclear. One prevalent thought is that thymosin stimulates the activity of lymphocytes to migrate to other lymphatic tissues.